85 to 95 was a contracting business and in 95 we saw an opportunity in real estate and that is how we shifted slowly slowly to real estate and it over more than 28,000 to 30,000 houses free of cost to slum dwellers. Wow. Unfortunately between one and a half year got lost in uh, COVID and then to recover that was a time lost. We are selling two bedroom hall kitchen with 320 square feet at 1 crore 80 lakhs where two bedroom will never be available less than 8 to 12 crores because of the size and the compact design but with the same luxury. Hi everyone, I'm Xenia Fernandez and I'm so thrilled to welcome you to a conversation with one of the stalwarts of the real estate sector of this country. Well, in 1985, as a qualified chartered accountant, he went on to co-found Hubtown and his expertise, of course, lied in corporate accounts and corporate finance and in law. Fast forward to 2024, he now stands as the managing director of Hubtown Limited. And of course, we also know him as the former president of MCHI Credi. Now, while all of these are his core credentials, I would say his true introduction is the fact that he is a visionary of the real estate industry. We all know him as the one who pioneered the concept of SRA housing and urban renewal schemes in Mumbai. In fact, his acumen extends, goes beyond organizational boundaries with his active participation in industrial associations. And we're so thrilled to have this chat with him because I'm very curious to know what is his stance in 2024 as far as real estate is concerned. In conversation with Mr. Vyome Shah, whom we also know as Mr. Vimal Shah. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you for inviting me for this. Thank our you. pleasure, our absolute pleasure, sir. And of course, I'm very curious to know your stance as far as real estate is concerned in 2024 in India. But before we actually get there, I want to rewind a little bit to 1985. Uh, when it all started and I wanted to ask you this four decade long marriage that you have was it love at first sight with real estate or is there another story? No, there is another story. I am okay. by profession a chartered accountant. Yes. So I was practicing as a chartered accountant then we diverted into uh, construction that is contracting business. Okay. So from 85 to 95 was a contracting business and in 95 we saw an opportunity in real estate and that is how we shifted slowly, slowly to real estate. And the journey was starting with slum rehabilitation scheme, which nobody was doing it ever. Yes. At that point of time in 1995, slum redevelopment scheme was practically unheard of. And uh, mobilizing the people, mobilizing the slum dwellers, mobilizing the people to trust you, because in past what has happened before 1995, a lot of slum redevelopment schemes by a lot of people were implemented only to flee slum dwellers. Yeah. It never actually took off. But taking an advantage of a provision in uh, then uh, development control regulation of slum redevelopment, we, uh, we shifted our focus to slum, re slum redevelopment from contracting. And uh, we started mobilizing hundreds of slum dwellers to join the slum redevelopment scheme by holding street meetings, night meetings, small gully meetings and all those things and uh, slowly slowly we had a lot of slum dwellers joining us we have till now handed over more than 28,000 to 30,000 houses free of cost to slum dwellers wow. so we have been in slum redevelopment we actually we are the pioneers in slum redevelopment scheme including uh, framing of the rules how it has to be done how it is to be implemented then we shifted to urban renewal schemes also so journey has been absolutely eventful and no regrets because while we really made success our success was also linked to what people term as csr i mean giving house to slum dwellers yes. free of cost yes. right from 1998 till date and we have been quite successful in it and rather very few developers have been able to survive so many years in slum redevelopment and we are one of them so we are happy about it i can totally imagine what that journey would be like so mr shah a marriage like this uh, you know it's like hollywood films right and they come in multiple genres so is your journey a comedy a drama a horror or a thriller no it's surely a thriller for the simple reason that uh, there was no horror in this there was a joy in this that is and 
comedy i would not say comedy because we were in a serious business of providing houses to slum dwellers sure. so that was a serious effort uh, what had happened till we entered in slum development and was surely a comedy but a sad film for slum dwellers and comedy for the developers but after we have entered it's been thriller for slum dwellers also and thriller for us also mm-hmm. because they have really got the houses and not only me now more than 2 and 1/2 lakh houses have been delivered but i'm i'm very happy to say that i am the pioneer of that and i am the beginner of that absolutely that's so, exactly how i introduced you uh, to everyone who's watching us right now and talking about thriller uh, and your incredible journey it still continues i want to talk about where we stand now as far as 2024 is concerned in q1 we've seen a surge of 38% of registrations I want to ask you that how do you see industry leaders capitalize on this sudden surge of growth and how do you think uh, this matters especially considering the variability of affordability in the city uh really speaking i am seeing this happening since 2019 uh unfortunately between one and a half year we got lost in uh, covid and then to recover that was a time lost because the amount of money which uh, was being pumped into infrastructure by the governments all across this country by all the governments and if you really see the growth of europe the growth of uh, usa all western countries have grown only when the infrastructure was monies were pumped into infrastructure and the, the and the entire growth story started of those countries japan everybody japan after second world war they shifted the entire gear in creating infrastructure yes usa after first recession shifted the entire uh, story to infrastructure we started the real story of infrastructure in 2014 after this government came till that time we were very low in infra- infrastructure investment but considering the amount of infrastructure which went from 2014 the multiplier effect had to come after 6 to 7 years so it should have started from 2020 mm-hmm. but for covid it got delayed right. so from 2023 i see the same story going on till 2029 30 for sure uh you know since you are actually comparing the india story to our neighboring countries i'm very keen to understand from you because when you look at numbers it is very clear that india's real estate market has some catching up to do while china delivers 1.1 crore houses uh, this year we have india that has de- delivered about 600000 houses only which is so china nearly 10 times more so my question to you is what do you think are the likely factors besides what you already mentioned that are contributing to the disparity If you really want to follow China then you are following the big bubble there. Okay. Mm-hmm. So let's not get carried away by China experience and China's story. Uh, China is suffering heavily because of real estate bubble now. All the big companies are going bankrupt. So what is happening in the this country considering it's a democracy, considering it's a free market, considering that the risk and reward is of a private individual. Uh, don't expect us to be in mad rush like china and we should not we should not copy their model which is a communist country which is complete control economy you never there is risk and reward is there but then government controls everything ultimately whether you believe it or not i mean everything is government control and what do you think is the role of the real estate sector in nation building in india real estate is a major role mm-hmm. because see at some point of time infrastructure investment saturates like in usa it saturates at that point of time the real estate investment never saturates so the growth story coming out investment today it is both moving together but tomorrow it will be more real estate taking over the infrastructure today infrastructure is here real estate is here in growth story slowly slowly this will be going like this and then it will come like this so it is always real estate can never be ignored or can not have lesser important role in economic development of our country forever let's talk about urbanization from 31% in 2011 to 40% today uh, in 2024 we're looking at nearly you know 600 million people in indian cities and towns now 
do you think that indian cities are currently built to accommodate this kind of an influx there is a very standard news item which comes in newspapers okay that is Bom mumbai infrastructure capable of taking so much population and this i have been reading since last 40 years wow. okay that even 1998 all ngos were complaining that mumbai infrastructure will come with it's a very simple thing in life that if you concentrate and develop the infrastructure development is required on a concentrated area but if you spread wide and develop the infrastructure expenses increases because infrastructure has to reach a very widespread we are ignoring all this and then we are saying whether cities are capable of taking up the infrastructure yes infrastructure will definitely we should reach a level but we have not reached economically that level of growth that we should be ahead of population growth okay hmm. but if you see mumbai population growth is exponential you and i both will agree from last 40 years 1998 you know how much infrastructure has growth has grown up water is reaching everybody sewage is reaching everybody the roads network is increasing metro is started so we are little behind in planning that's a problem with this country that we are behind in planning but we are catching up we will till we reach a level where we are not deficit economy but we are surplus economy we will always be behind so so with your kind of expertise you think there's not going to be uh, a time where we will require any sort of uh, city correction in no, terms of space no, planning should not what you need is an exceptional development plan thoughts so you create development plans which are futuristic you don't create development plan for next 15 years actually you should create development plan for next 60 years uh, barcelona is a classic example when i was there the central road of barcelona was 300 feet i mean 300 feet and i asked them when this was done this was done in 1700 when the population was nothing so it was a planning which was done for far ahead yes since we were always short of resources we are a resource surplus natural resource surplus hmm. but deployment shortage people so we have the largest resources of the world but deployment when it comes to deployment we are far behind hmm. so that gap is filling up the governments are awakened of to that hmm. and if you see the amount of metro roads not only in this city hmm. you see all secondary cities are developing very well the road network is developing very well the primary cities like even Ahmedabad, Surat, Nagpur everybody is you see infrastructure is catching up yes affordability and I absolutely loved your take on it you said that affordability has everything to do with location you know so uh, affordability in Nepensi road is very different from that in Borivli West. My question to you is how do you think the industry can strike a balance between luxury living and between this varying spectrum of affordability depending on location in a city? I would put it that the luxury element of real estate has to be in all sectors of the housing. Hmm. It should not be restricted only to Nepens Road. Even if I am constructing a project in Daisar or Vira, it must have a luxury element. Okay, so distinguish between affordability and luxury. Luxury has to be everywhere because everybody buys houses, buys one house mostly in their Absolutely. lifetime. Yes. And he wants to have the best of it. Yep. So let, it, let them have luxury because cost of luxury mm. for a real estate developer, implementing a luxury in a project is not much comparing to the sale price mm. so the, it's a mindset uh, but the million dollar question really is why this demand continues to remain how long do you reckon this will this continue and what do you think is the role of both the builder and the buyer in bringing this luxury living to the end user going back to my first answer this demand is not because of in the covid there was a need for housing felt the demand is arising because of economic growth and you know from what i'm taking away from this conversation really 
is that uh, at Hoptown and especially you being a visionary in the real estate, I think it's time that we redefine these concepts of luxury, of affordability, of location. And then all of these questions that I'm asking you will also change. Change. Right? See, at Hoptown, I'm also constructing, like I'm constructing this luxury apartment of 3,000, 5,000 square feet. Right. Of four bedrooms only. We are also constructing 320 square feet, two bedroom, hall, kitchen, two bathrooms. Wow. Right? And with full luxury. Means it has the same gym, it has the same facilities. So it's 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 it's, it's affordable because even at uh, location which is like at Worli, hmm. we are selling two bedroom hall kitchen with 320 square feet at one crore 80 lakhs, where two bedroom will never be available less than eight to twelve crores because of the size and the compact design, but with the same luxury, a super. Uh, luxury houses though i want to call affordable housing also is affordable luxury housing yes but uh, no. because it's, it's a <laughs> misnomer which i can't change overnight right. so it's affordable housing though it's affordable luxury housing and this is super luxury housing so we we understand all this and we cater to all the markets mr shah from luxury living let's start with the point where a buyer can actually get to that kind of lifestyle which is payment plans which are quite the trending topic uh, for the last few years. How do you see the role of payment plans in the real estate sector as going from just smoothening out transactions to actually building a lot of trust and satisfaction between a buyer and the builder? Yeah, this was true um, maybe before RERA came. That payment plan really helped to build the trust. Means you say I'll collect only 20% now, 80% at the time of occupation certificate. I strongly believe as a philosophy that we are not in the business of financing and neither we should have a deep pocket like a pension fund. Real estate is a business which is for constructing house and selling and selling over a, as per the normal any turnover of a business. So when you go to buy a car, the, the finance company funds the car. The car company does not fund you. If I want to give a payment plan, then I must either have a finance company which is supporting me, which is which which should be normal way. But any developer who is indulging in a payment plan by himself is going to run into a big problem later on. Rather, those are the plan, those are the developers the buyer should not trust. Because he's trying to push you to buy on the basis of payment plan and not on the basis of his past track record or not on the basis of his delivery schedule. And, and developer can't be in a pension fund business. So NBFCs and finance companies have to take up the role. So you want a payment plan from me? Please come to me. My payment plan is linked to construction as, as per law. You take fund from that company which is giving you fund, the State Bank of India. They are into this business. They have a wherewithal to collect money from you. They have wherewithal to do everything. So they will fund you then you go for any 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 situation so it is always better to go for a developer who is not in a funding business because that is not his core business it's not his core strength mr shah recently at the mint india investment summit uh, when the subject of sebi's recent regulation on reits came up you sounded very positive and very excited so i am curious to know that how do you think this development is going to very importantly boost investor confidence and how do you think it's going to change the landscape and the future of real estate in india see real estate as an part of an investment portfolio for anybody has been a most difficult investment yes shares have been good gold have been good diamonds have been good of course diamond has its own plus minus but all these investment opportunities were available where a person even with 1 lakh rupees can save or 5 lakh rupees can save. Real estate as a portfolio one must have in it as a bifurcation of risk. Yes. But there was no way real estate can be invested unless the REIT which is now residential REIT which is being allowed. So now we will have uh, REITs arising out of commercial mm -hmm. which was allowed and REITs arising out of residential premises. When all these REITs come in, the person will be able to invest money in a small ticket size of 5 lakhs and 10 lakhs. So when he has an investable surplus of say 50 lakhs only, 
he wants to put 20 lakhs in shares 10 lakhs in gold or 10 lakhs in some fixed deposit and only 10 lakhs in real estate which earlier there was no such opportunity available mm -hmm. so slowly slowly everybody will build into their portfolio the spread of the investment which is part of real estate and that is why i was very excited that rbi has finally awakened to the necessity of of course the state laws have still have to change the stamp duty mm. law which is there has to change first simultaneously now and i hope that the states will follow the suit yes totally you know it's interesting how uh, corporate players have been doing this cyclical dance in the real estate sector from 2003 to 2007 like even you rightly pointed out the <coughs> other day at the summit we saw an influx uh, by 2018, we saw most of them depart and now it's 2024 and well, once again, you can see them, uh, you know, joining us and playing the dance. Now, my question is that in such a scenario, how is a long-standing multi-generational institution like yours at Hubtown holding its ground and how do you differentiate from them? See, for a corporate, it's an opportunity which they take and they don't mind exiting because that opportunity does not exist. Mm -hmm. That's that's how they are in multi, multiple businesses and they, they close down business, they open the business and that's that normal cycle. They sell also the businesses. So for a corporate, it's a, it's a, it's a complete cyclical business even for real estate and they will be in it till there is a growth in it. Moment they see there is no growth in it, they will be out. So, and of course, it's like um, a movie with Amitabh Bachchan comes after five years. Mm. People will throw into the theater since you talked about film. Mm -hmm. So it's it's like this. So when the corporate suddenly comes after five years and there are the corporate announcing, yeah. Godrej announcing or X announcing or Y announcing. So there is there is a thrill for it. So people queue up for them, Mirla entering into it. Very clear. One thing people are sure that these corporates will not fail in delivery. Okay, because they have a brand image to keep them with, which I also believe that they should not fail in delivery. I am not sure about it, but they should not. But when it comes to building up the brand as a real estate developer, they will be relying on their brand of a corporate and never as a real estate developer brand. Because they will quit the business of real estate moment downturn starts. And they will rejoin it when the upturn starts. So for us, we are steady, we are continuous. So people value us completely differently than them. And that distinction everybody knows. Mm. So so I, I, I see no reason that and as long as the demand which I am feeling is going to grow, it's a market for everybody. And if we, if the demand goes down, I'm sure the corporates will vanish, so I will sustain. Wow, I absolutely love that outlook. You know, as I'm sitting here and listening to you, I'm of course uh, listening to a visionary and a man who's had the skin in the game for the last four decades. Uh, you spoke about community building as well early on, so I'm very curious to know, as a pioneer of SRA and urban renewal schemes, you would have invested so much of this lifetime into helping others and this nation grow. But what do you do when you're not working? What does your life look like, other than all of these amazing things that you do? I, am, I mean, I have a lot of... I enjoy my life thoroughly. And it's, it's, of course, I'm a mad alcoholic, no mm. doubt about it. But simultaneously, I, I like I am a good singer. I sing. Uh, okay. I am so a, is that my cue to make you sing right now? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I mean it's okay. Uh, then I mean I am also I, I have a lot of reading habits on religion side. Mm -hmm. So I do that and travel. Of course, I enjoy traveling. So I, whenever there is a time, travel with friends. 
So that's how it is. That is absolutely beautiful. So now that you've given me the personal angle, uh, let's move back to professional. And I'm very curious to understand, as someone who's been in the business for four decades, how have you constantly made sure that you've kept the spark of innovation alive as an individual and also at, at an entity level? You are building a business for decay uh, generations. So I'm not, I, I'm not in it for myself only. I'm in it for my next generation and then after next generation, hopefully. But at least when I was building or when I was in it, I was very sure that I'm building it for my next generations. So if you are building a business for the uh, generations, then you can never get tired because you have to, like I explained the answer for corporates, that your innovation and your delivery for satisfaction, I'm not saying delivery for actual housing, but the ultimate satisfaction of consumer is evolving continuously because consumer's expectation in 1960s was different, 70s was completely different. 2010 was completely different and 2024 is completely different. At the end of this conversation, one thing is very clear that Mr. Vyomesh Shah is very, very positive about the real estate industry in 2024 in India. I think we understood some very interesting trends and strategies from him, ways of how an Indian builder can stay ahead of the curve. I also love the little and interesting anecdotes that he spoke to us about. All in all, it's going to be a year to look forward to. My name is Zenia Fernandez and I'm signing off. Thank you for joining us.